Open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse number 16. John, chapter number 3, verse 16. For God, thank you, you, you may be seated. For God, I want to talk this morning about the Bible in a nutshell. John chapter 3 and verse 16 is probably the best known verse in the Bible. Perhaps it is the first verse that we ever learn and the last one we ever forget. Some years ago there was a woman in the nursing home in Kenner, Louisiana who was 106 years old. It was her birthday and the television station went there to interview her, to talk to her, to get a, a word from her. She did not know her own name. She did not remember any of her children. She did not know where she was. But they asked her, did she remember anything? And she said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Herschel Hobbes called this verse the gospel in superlatives. Martin Luther says John 3.16 is the Bible in miniature. Others have called it the Mount Everest of Scripture, the highest point in the Bible. But I want to call it this morning the Bible in a nutshell. If all the other verses in the Bible were lost and this one verse remained, all the Bible is contained in this one verse. There's enough gospel truth in John 3.16 to save whosoever will have faith in Jesus Christ. Here is a verse so profound that if all the scholars of the ages could plummet its depths, it would take an eternity for them to get to the bottom of it. Yet the verse is so simple that a little child in Sunday school can understand what it means. This simple verse is inexhaustible because it is about the love of God. I have given myself, Lily Grove, an impossible assignment in these series of sermons for who can fully expound the love of God. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made? Brothers and sisters, if every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though it stretch from sky to sky. No one of us in here this morning, no one of us on earth today, could get to the bottom of the love of God. But I want to examine this marvelous verse this morning in some detail. And hopefully I will not destroy it uh, as you would destroy a flower by trying to analyze its parts. I want to begin this morning with for God. Next Sunday I want to talk about so love. The Sunday after that, the world, and on until we get to the end of that verse. For God answers 
atheism. So loved answers fatalism. The world answers Trump's nationalism. That he gave answers materialism. His only begotten son answers Mohammedism. Whosoever believes answers Calvinism. Shall not perish answers annihilationism, but have everlasting life answers Arminianism. John 3.16 is a biblicism which reveals the mind, the heart, and the will of God the Father. Let's examine this matter of for God. The verse, brothers and sisters, begins its explanation of love by going to the origin of that love, uh, the heart of God himself. The word for God in the Greek text is the word theos, and that word theos in the Greek is singular. There are not many gods. There is an attempt by atheists and others around the world to claim that there are thousands of gods and, and people say there are many ways to get to God, but there is only one God according to the scripture. And the Bible does not try at all to even prove the existence of God. The Bible just opens by saying, in the beginning, God. Uh, brothers and sisters, the God of love is not just one of many gods. He is the only God there is. Allah and Buddha do not exist. Allah and Buddha do not exist. The Allah and Buddha do not exist. The only God that exists is the God of the Bible. He is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere. He's omniscient, which means he knows everything. He's omnipotent, which means he has all power. But the fundamental assertion about God in the text is that God is omnibenevolent, which means he is all loving. David Wells writes, a God with whom we are on easy terms and a God whose reality is little different from ours is a God that we merely make up in our minds and sooner or later we get bored with. I would get bored with a God who is a man upstairs. I would get bored with a God who is a higher power. I would get bored with a God who's a little higher than a man. That, that would be fascinating for a moment. Uh, that, that, that would really be uh, a novelty for a moment. But when I get in trouble, I don't need a man upstairs. When my heart is broken, I don't need a higher power. When my life is turned upside down, I don't need a God who's a little higher than a man. I need somebody who can come and pick me up. I need somebody who can come and make my life make sense and save me from myself. Oh, brothers and sisters, let me see before I move into this little message. Um, of all the 8 billion plus people on this planet, God loves each and every one of us individually. There are over 8 billion people alive on the planet. And the 8 billion of us who are alive on the planet does not divide God's love into 8 billion people. Let me, let me, let me see if I can make that make sense. Um, in 1973... My brother Steve was shot in the back and killed on the campus of Grambling College. 
Uh, he was a senior at Grambling, getting ready to graduate uh, that, the, the, the May of 1973. He was killed in February of 1973. And my mother was inconsolable. For days on end before Steve's funeral, my mother would scream and cry all day long. From the time she woke up in the morning till the time she went to bed at night, my mother was inconsolable. People would come to the house to try to comfort her. My father would try to comfort her. We would try to comfort her. My mother wouldn't eat. She wouldn't sleep. She screamed and, and cried until my brother Steve's funeral. One day, uh, a lady came, Miss Sister Lauderdale, who was a member of another church, came to console her and was fanning her and patting her on the back and trying to, to get her to calm down. And, and Sister Lauderdale said to my mother, you have to remember you have some other children. And my mother stopped crying just like that and got angry. And she stopped crying and she looked at Miss Lauderdale and she said, no one of my children take the other child's place. Because I don't divide my love between my children. I multiply it. And she went back to screaming and crying. But, but, but I, want, I want to mention that this morning because of all of the people on the planet, God doesn't have to divide his love to share with us. The 8 billion of us on the planet causes God to multiply his love. The same love he has for me, he has it in the same measure for you. For him to love me does not take his love away from you. That's why no one of us ought to be envious of any of the rest of us because Jesus loves every last one of us the same measure. Somebody ought to help me preach here this morning. I, I don't have to get upset if God goes to see about you. Because when I get in trouble, he'll come see about me. I don't have to be angry if God blesses you. Because the same God that blesses you will bless me in like measure. Um, the scripture talks about the, the breasts and the length and the height and the depth of the love of God. That's what the Bible says theologically. But the old folk back in Louisiana where I'm from used to say he's so high you can't get over him. He's so low you can't get under him. He's so wide you can't go around him. You've got to come in at the door. And brothers and sisters, God is so immense. God is so transcendent that he's outside everything he created, but his transcendence does not remove his eminence. He is transcendent of us, but he is eminently with us. The scripture says he's Emmanuel. God with us. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Uh, he's not just on the pew with you on Sunday. Uh, maybe that's why you got to sit in the same spot every Sunday because that's where you left him last Sunday. But I need to tell you, you can take him home. You can take him to work. You can let him ride in the car with you. You can take him to the restaurant with you. You can take him when you're in your leisure. You can take him in your playtime. You can take God to the hospital. You can take God with you everywhere because there's nowhere God is not. The psalmist in Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, he's there. If I make my bed in hell, he's there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the earth, even there shall God hold me. Hold me. Hold me. That, that's the kind of God. I, I don't need a God I have to carry. I need a God that can carry me. Uh, 
I'm, I'm trying to move on to the body of this little sermon. But um, when, when, when Victoria was, a, was a, a small child, just learning to walk and just learning to talk, um, we'd go someplace uh, to a restaurant or mall, any place we went, uh, and she would walk because she was just learning to walk. She was excited about walking. But soon she would get tired of walking. She'd get tired of trying to walk and keep up. And so I would walk slowly so that I could hold her hand and, and carry her with me. But my legs were longer, and I thought I was walking slow, but I was really taking her too fast. And she'd stop wherever we were, in the middle of wherever we were walking. She'd stop. She couldn't say, pick me up. She'd say, pick up me. <laughs> uh, and wherever we were, I would stop doing what I was doing and pick up her. Uh, life gets hard sometimes. Uh, burden gets heavy sometimes. And I'm walking with God, but, but sometimes I can't keep up. And there are days when I have to look up to my father and say, pick up me. Is there anybody here ever had to go up to God and say, father, I stretch. I wish I had a witness. God, I'm tired. Pick up me. God, I'm weak. Pick up me. God, I need your strength. Pick up me. I'm not talking to you proud people in here this morning. I'm not talking to you arrogant worshipers in here this morning. I'm talking to a believer whose back has been up against the wall and God showed up just when you needed him the most. I'm talking to somebody who's been down to your last dime and you didn't know how you were going to make it another week. But God let that car run on fumes. He just made a way out of no way Pick up me. Yeah. The clearest picture of God in the scripture this morning is Isaiah chapter 6. Um, Isaiah says it was in the year that King Isaiah died that I saw also the Lord. Hi. And lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim with, with six wings. With two wings they covered their face. With two wings they covered their feet. With two wings they did fly. And one cried to another. Holy. Holy. Holy, the whole earth is full of your glory. And the doorposts moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. If you're going to get a good idea of who God is, you got to see what Isaiah saw. High and lifted up. You can't praise God like you ought to if your view of God is at ground level. If you're going to shout in his presence, he's got to be high and lifted up. If you can't give God glory this morning, your God is too low. You have too low a view of God. That's why you're arrogant in his presence. Because your view of God is so low. That's why you can't open your mouth to give him praise. Because your view of God is so low. But when you see God high and lifted up, you recognize the majesty of God and the misery of your own life. How majestic is your name. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. When I consider the heavens, 
the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you've ordained. What is man that you're so mindful of it? And the son of man that you would even visit him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. Brothers and sisters, you know what I wish we could recover? I wish we could recover what our elders had when it came to giving God reverence. When it came to giving God respect. When it came to giving God praise. They would not come in the Lord's house unless they bowed their head in prayer. I wish I had somebody who was raised with old folk like I was raised. If a funeral procession was passing by, men who were drinking would take their hats off. Because here is a funeral procession. If, if a lady was on her way to church, they would stop gambling. They would stop shooting dice. Because Miss Ella was on her way to prayer meeting. That was a reverence and a respect for the things of God. They didn't argue and fuss and fight. And get mad at the Lord's house. They went so far as you couldn't put your hand on the Lord's supper table. It was holy. Somebody ought to help me preach it. It belonged to the Lord. And the things of God were holy. You couldn't even walk across the pulpit to clean it. Because that's where Rav stood on Sunday morning. And that pulpit was, was holy because the man of God spoke the oracles of God. And here you come in the Lord's house acting like you're going to a civic center. Acting like you're going to some social club. But God is high and lifted up. And his train fills the temple. But here's the part of that vision that Isaiah saw that makes me shout every time I read it. He said, the seraphim, the burning ones, sang in antiphonal praise one to another in the presence of God Almighty. Holy, 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 the whole earth. It's full of your glory. There are no marks of punctuation in the Hebrew language. Uh, so whenever a word is lifted to the superlative degree, there's a way to do that in Hebrew. In the English language, if we want to make a word superlative at the end of the word or the end of the sentence, we put an exclamation point to lift the word to the superlative degree. But in the Hebrew or in the Greek, when a word is lifted to the superlative degree, because there are no marks of punctuation, the word is repeated to lift it to the superlative degree. In the New Testament, when, when Jesus wanted them to know something really important, he said, verily, verily. He said that twice to lift what he was about to say to the superlative degree. And in the Old Testament, when in the Hebrew, which the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, when they wanted to lift a word to the superlative degree, they said it three times in succession. Holy, holy, holy. Notice, God is never referred to as mercy, mercy, mercy. Or love, love, love. Or power, power is always holy, 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 which means God is indefatigably holy. He's inexpressibly holy. He's holy beyond definition. He's holy beyond explanation. He's holy beyond what we can think that holiness is. So holy, Isaiah says, that our righteousness in his presence is as filthy rags. There is none righteous, no, not even one. So when we come in God's presence, leave your ego outside. 
Leave your arrogant self-esteem outside because there is none like him. But that's not all Isaiah saw. Isaiah, saw, Isaiah said, I saw the doorposts moved. Another translation is the doorposts shouted. I want you to get this. They, they were fastened to the floor, to the joists in the roof, and they were down on the floor, which made a foundation for the temple. But when God came in, Isaiah said the doorposts unhinged themselves and moved. Inanimate wooden objects got up from their moorings and shouted. Pieces of wood got up from where they were fastened down and gave God glory. Now if a piece of wood that has no soul can shout in the presence of God, how dare you sit here looking like a piece of wood? A piece of wood shouted and God saved you and you look like a piece of wood. I hear you, I, I, I hear you, I hear you. I, I used to sit in the pew, I hear you. I know what you're saying. I don't do that. That's, that's just not who I am. It, it, I, I really don't think it takes all of that. I ain't high-fiving my neighbor. I ain't, I ain't hugging nobody. I didn't come here for all that. Preach to me and let me get out of here. No, all that shouting they did a while ago. Oh, Lord. When, when, when we going to move on? Any time for intercessory prayer? The choir, they, they don't know when to get through singing. The musicians just keep on playing that sanctified music. That gets on my nerves. And then I know he's going to get up there and talk an hour. Lord have mercy. Let me see I'm, what, what I'm going to eat today. I wonder if mom and them got some greens over there. And all kind of stuff goes in your mind and you, you sitting here stone faced because in your mind it don't take all of that. Well, bougie one, speak for yourself. Maybe you ain't got nothing to be grateful for. Maybe God hasn't opened a door for you. Maybe God hasn't made a way for you, so you just go right back to looking wooden. But to those of us who know, if the Lord hadn't come through, I would have lost my mind. If the Lord hadn't healed my body, I would be dead and in my grave. If you don't want to praise him, I will. If you don't want to magnify his name, I will. If you don't want to tell him thank you, I will bless the Lord at all times. You can come by my house and I'll be giving God praise. You can ride with me in the car and I'll be telling God thank you. You can sit down and listen to my conversation and it won't be long until I get around to how good God's been to me. Have you ever been around somebody who loves the Lord? It won't be two minutes before they start mentioning God made a way for me. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side and lift it up. You have to see what Isaiah saw. And then if you're going to get a good view of God, you got to sense 
S-E-N-S-E, sense what Isaiah sensed. He said, when I saw that beatific vision, when I saw the seraphim and the doorposts unfastening and shouting in the presence of God, I said, woe is me. For I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. When I saw God's majesty, I saw myself in my misery. Somebody ought to help me talk here. You can't really see who you really are till you stand up next to God. Don't, don't, don't measure yourself by me because you're using the wrong yardstick. If you never told a lie, you're taller than me. I wish I had a witness here. If you never crossed the line and sinned since you've been saved, you're much bigger than me. Because there are some sinners here like myself who can testify that since we've been saved, our cry has been, woe is me. For I am, not was, I am undone. A man of unclean lips. That word undone in the text means I disintegrate in the presence of God. I'm ground into a powder in the presence of God. I'm absolutely worthless in the presence of God. God has no reason to save me because there's no good thing in me. Jeremiah says the heart of a man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You think you're doing right and you're doing wrong. And then if there's no wrong to do, you'll think of something wrong to do. Because we are desperately wicked. Woe is me. For I am undone. We, we, we get the wrong picture of church when we think the church is full of people who got it all together. And, and you don't join the church until you get all this mess out of your life and, and you don't come to Christ until you start getting stuff straight in your life. That's not what the church is made of. Church is made up of some crooked people, some wayward people, some backslidden people, but God is in love with the backslider. I wish I had a Bible reader here. That's a messed up folk on the pew next to you. Wait a minute. No, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You messed up. And God still loves you. God still blesses you. God still makes a way for you. And when you come in God's presence, acknowledge that. Whoa! Is me. For I am, not was, I am undone, a man of unclean lips. And I live with people with unclean lips. Ah, oh, brothers and sisters, you got to sense that. You have to press that to your heart if you're going to be all the Christian God wants you to be. I know you got a little fish on your bumper. And... And I know you answer your phone, praise the Lord, and you're too blessed to be stressed, and you're blessed and highly favored, and since you've been in church teaching Sunday school, or you've been in church all your life, you just look down your sanctimonious nose at people because you don't do that no more. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. 
Don't do it no more. Ain't got nothing to do with you being so spiritual. You old. You learned some sense. Talk back to me if you can. You come in out of the rain. Y'all gonna help me preach this, won't you? It ain't because you're so spiritual and you love God so much. It's just some things you can't do no more because of time. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, beloved. When I think about what God not only brought me from, but kept me from. Hurt, harm, and danger. And then delivered me out of the mess I got myself in. When I come in his presence, I can't do anything but give God glory, honor, and praise. And look at God and look at myself and say, Whoa! Is me. For I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. But then something happened in the text. Isaiah said, the seraphim who were giving God glory went to the altar with with some tongs. And, And they took burning coal, live burning coal off the altar and put it on my lips. They took burning coal and seared Isaiah's lips and sizzled Isaiah's lips. The burning coal touched his lips and seared it, sizzled it. And until God can touch your lips with live coal from off the altar, Because when God touches your lips, you stop talking about people. You stop criticizing other people. You stop making small of people. You you, you remember in the New Testament when Jesus healed that man of blindness and then he came and asked the man, what do you see? The man said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. And Jesus touched his eyes again and asked him, what did he see? And then he said, I see men rightly. Jesus had to get his sight straight because if you see men as trees, you're going to start cutting them down. And chopping on them. Climbing on them. And so God got to fix your sight so you can see people as you really ought to see people. And speak about people really the way you ought to speak about people. Because the scripture says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. But your lips have got to be seared. Then they can sizzle. Folk who can't praise God with a loud voice. Or perhaps those people whose lips have not been seared are sizzling. Because when God touches your lips and puts some live coal to burn off the impurities of life, he gives you a testimony. He gives you a word. And you don't have to be a preacher to have a word. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher to have a word. You can be a Christian and have a word. You got to see what Isaiah saw, sense what Isaiah sensed, and when that happens, you can finally say what Isaiah said. He said he put that live coal on my lips, and and when he touched my lips, my ears opened. That's a strange thing. God touches his lips, and it opens his ears. It's not until God tells you to shut up that you can hear something. Somebody ought to help me talk here. 
You, you ever wondered why you have two eyes, two ears, and one mouth? Because God wants you to see and hear twice as much as you speak and say. Because you can't say anything until you feel something. And some of us are trying to say something for God and God has never touched our lips. I wish I had time to stay right there. But Isaiah said when he put that live coal on my lips, I heard the voice of God saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. But brothers and sisters, you can't say something till you see something. And when you see God's power at work in your life, I, I'm running out of time here, but if you see God moving in your life, you can't help but say something. When you see how far God has brought you, you got to say something. When you recognize how God skipped over some people to bless you, you got to say something. When you see how you're the last one left in your family and God's still keeping you looking good and strong, you got to say something. When you see how God has protected you when people tried to get you fired on your job and the same folk who set a trap for you, God let them fall in it, you ought to say something. Now, this sermon, this little word is not for little quiet worshipers. It's not for little dainty worshipers. It's not for little cute worshipers. This word is for people who know how to holler and know how to tell God thank you and don't care who looking at you, don't care who you sitting by. Matter of fact, you bring a little thing with you sometimes and say, nah, uh, don't sit right there if you can't stand no holler. Uh, you, you might want to go somewhere else if you can't stand no racket. Because over here in this section, it's about to get noisy. On this road where I am, it's about to get loose. So you might want to give me some space right now. Uh, you, you might want to move back a little bit because this preacher getting ready to talk about Jesus. And uh, I got some situations I need the Lord to handle for me. I got some storms I'm about to go through that I need God to come to my rescue. I'm sick in my body and I need God to heal me. And Reverend is about to tell me what kind of God he's talking about. And I need you to move out of my way because you look like you don't like to shout. So you have my permission right in the middle of the closing of this little sermon to get away from that dead spot that you're in and find some people who look like they woke up this morning with their mind stayed on Jesus you might be in a dead section where, where God is trying to get a signal in and, and they jamming the signal because they asking you for peppermint and, and asking you for some paper to write something and hunching you because they are looking at somebody else shouting and carrying on get away from them people because they are a dead spot you need somebody who's been through something Somebody who know that God can answer prayer. That God can open a door. That God can make a way. That God can be a mother for you. That God can wipe tears away. That God can put food on your table. That God can make a way out of no way. Why don't you find somebody who look like they feel like giving God praise. If the Lord open doors for you, praise him if you got to do it by yourself. If the Lord made a way for you, holler if you got to be the only one on your road. If the Lord paid your bills for you, 
give God the glory. If the Lord delivered you in your divorce, tell God thank you. If the Lord helped you raise your children by yourself, tell God thank you. If the Lord been a doctor for you, he's been a lawyer for you, if the Lord saved you and you're not ashamed to testify, why don't you find somebody who look like they want to give God the glory? And both of y'all right now, why don't you grab your partner and both of y'all right now say you don't know like I know. You can't tell it. Let me tell it. What the Lord has done for me. Come on, use your preaching voice. Come on, say as loud as you can. God has been good to me. God has made a way for me. God has delivered me. God has rescued me. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? One more thing I'd like for you to do this morning. You don't know who you're sitting next to. You don't know what your neighbor is going through. Put your arm around him right now. Look at him in the face. Tell him, be not dismayed. Whatever be time. God will take care of you. Tell them whatever you going through, this too will pass. Won't he do it? Won't he make a way? Won't he do it? He died. Didn't he die? But early Sunday morning, he arose. I know he's all right. I know what y'all trying to do. Y'all trying to make me too tired to preach at 11 o'clock. I know what y'all trying to do. Y'all trying to make me leave it all here so I don't have anything left for 11 o'clock. But I know what the Lord can do. I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roll. I felt sins breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus bidding me still fight on. He promised, he promised, he promised. I said he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Won't he do it? Won't he come through? Won't he show up? Say yes! 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 I know he's alright. God. God. If you can't remember anything else, for God, for God.